Okay. Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation to present here. Uh, it's kind of funny not really seeing the audience at all. Uh, it's my first time giving a, a lecture over Zoom. Uh, but yeah, a little bit about myself. I'm in the Magnetic Resonance Physics and Instrumentation Group, uh, the MR Pigs, as we call ourselves. I work with John Palomeni on development of high resolution fMRI techniques and um, biophysical modeling of the bold signal. Uh, so today, yeah, we're going to give an overview of the physics behind uh, MRI. Oh, got to go. Uh, so here, this is just a series of images to exemplify kind of the wide range uh, of types of images we can generate with MRI. Uh, there's a huge range of contrast types uh, that are both kind of anatomically relevant as well as functionally relevant. Um, and so for this reason, MRI has been really powerful clinically as well as in research. And so MRI is itself a physical measurement. Oh, and I should, I should back up right now and just say that um, I have to thank Patrick McDaniel for several of these slides. He's given this talk many years uh, previously. Uh, and I'm so, so I've borrowed several of his slides. Um, and so anyways, this is, this is one of them. So this is kind of a general outline of the talk, but uh, MRI is a physical measurement with spatial information. And so kind of the focus of the talk is we're gonna to look into what is generating the signal itself in MRI. And so why are some regions bright and some dark? What are we measuring? And then the last part of the talk, we'll actually look at a little bit into how we form an image. Um, so how do we get these signals from different uh, spatial locations? Uh, although I will say that uh, Patrick has gone into more depth in this in his previous talks. So you can check out the Winehow wiki site for those slides as well. So first, uh, what exactly are we measuring with MRI? So primarily, uh, by far, most MRI studies are measuring water um, throughout the body. And water is the most abundant substance. Um, our brain consists of nearly 1.4 liters of water, uh, volume of water, most of which is water, uh, larger than Avogadro's number of water in there. And so in a millimeter cube of water, we have also uh, a very large amount of water. And a millimeter cube is roughly maybe the size of an MRI voxel. And in MRI, we're very sensitive to the chemical, molecular, and magnetic environments of water, which, which vary quite a bit uh, throughout the brain and throughout different tissues, especially soft tissues, which gives us this vast range of contrast that we see. And so MRI actually relies on the nuclear magnetic resonance phenomenon. So originally MRI was called NMRI. However, there was the fear of the N, uh, the nuclear word uh, back in the 1980s. And so that was dropped for just uh, MRI. And so N refers to that our signal in MRI is coming from atomic nuclei, specifically nuclei with an odd number of nucleons. And most predominantly, this is the hydrogen, hydrogen nucleus in water, uh, which is just a single proton. So we often also say we're, we're measuring nuclei or also protons when, or spins when we're referring to uh, hydrogen. It's, me it's measuring magnetic properties of the proton or the hydrogen nucleus. And we exploit a resonance phenomenon where we have a dependence on a specific frequency. So this is NMR. And I'm going to go into each of these components in a little bit more detail. So uh, like we said, N uh, MRI uses NMR to measure nuclei, specifically hydrogen, most predominantly. We already saw this slide. This is just to say that for the number of water molecules that we saw earlier, there's two hydrogen molecules for every water molecule. And so we're doubling, essentially, our signal sensitivity. We're not just sensitive to one molecule of water. We're sensitive to two hydrogen nuclei. Uh, but importantly, I should also say that there's several non-water nuclei that we can measure with MRI and that are very useful uh, clinically as well. Uh, this includes lipids or fat and several metabolites that are often measured with MR spectroscopy, like NAA, choline, glutamate, lactate, et cetera. And this is just sort of a MR spectrum that you often see, uh, which can be very useful uh, diagnostically. There's also several non-hydrogen nuclei that are measured, such as phosphorus-31, sodium-23, carbon-13, fluorine-19. Uh, but these are in very low abundance throughout the body, and so we have much, much less sensitivity to them uh, in MRI. And as a result, um, there's far fewer 
centers that are actually imaging these um, uh, nuclei. Also, in addition, there's hyperpolarized um, MRI where we can actually inject or inhale some additional um, uh, of the amounts of these nuclei, which have a very large magnetization, but decays away quite quickly. Uh, and we have, I believe we have now one or even maybe a second hyperpolarizer coming into the center now. So NMR measures the magnetism of the nuclei. And so specifically regarding the proton, the proton has this very, very small mass, as we're well aware from high school chemistry and physics. Uh, and it also is associated with a charge, which is uh, equal but opposite to that of an electron. And the proton has this quantum mechanical property where it can be thought of as a spinning. So it has a spin angular momentum uh, that is given by this formula here, h bar times square root of three, quarter, uh, three, yeah, three quarters. But there is no actual intrinsic spin. There isn't, there's nothing spinning as far as we're aware. Uh, it's just an intrinsic property of the proton. And associated with this, which is a, a magnetic dipole moment. So there's spin angular moment, momentum, and it's directly proportional, or the magnetic dipole moment is directly proportional to the angular momentum. And classically, we can think of this as um, if we have a charged surface that is spinning, this will generate a dipole moment. And so this is sort of the classical analogy. And what relates these two is this gamma variable, which is the gyromagnetic ratio of the proton in this case. And it's 42.58 megahertz per Tesla, and it comes up all the time in MRI. So it's a good number to know. <clears throat> a feature of these magnetic moments when they're inserted into a magnetic field is that they'll tend to align with a magnetic field. So first, let's just get a sense, though, for what the magnetic fields are like that we deal with in MRI. So they're on the range of 1.5 Tesla all the way up to 10.5 Tesla for human scanning. Um, if we use a rare earth magnet, like what's being developed in Larry Wald's lab by Patrick, who was giving this talk previously, uh, we can get up to one Tesla. Um, actually, I don't think Patrick was going up to one Tesla. Uh, but anyways, relative to Earth's magnetic field, which is 50 micro Tesla, the MRI fields we typically use in MRI, um, the magnetic fields we typically use in MRI are roughly 100,000 times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. So it's a very powerful magnet that's needed to generate these fields. And if we look at what's actually going on in the brain and look you know, closer in on what's going on with these magnetic dipole moments, is they actually tend to align with the direction of the external applied field, which we refer to here as B0. And the bar over top is to denote that this is a vector quantity, so it has magnitude and direction. And so the reason that they prefer to align with the, magnetic, uh, with, with the external field is that this is actually a lower energy state for the, for the um, spins to be uh, oriented in. But they don't all align with the external magnetic field. Actually, in fact, it's only one in 100,000 will tend to be aligned. And so this is our maximum available magnetization. It's very small. The reason this is so small is that it's, um, there's actually thermal fluctuations of all the molecules throughout this, the object being imaged or in the magnetic field uh, that tends to throw off um, the alignment from perfect 100% alignment. But uh, one important factor is that the amount that we tend to align with the magnetic field is directly proportional to the magnetic field itself. So this is one motivation for going to higher field strengths at MRI. And so the, like I was just saying, um, when we uh, put an object uh, in a magnetic field and uh, the magnetic dipole moment tends to align with the magnetic field, uh, we say that it's aligned along the longitudinal direction and it achieves an uh, equilibrium magnetization, which we refer to as M0. Uh, but having a static magnetic field um, in our object is not so useful. We actually need to perturb it away from this static state or steady state in order to be able to see something of interest. And so we do this with what's called excitation. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to go into more detail as to how we do that. But in this case, we rotate our, uh, mag our magnetization down into a transverse plane, so the xy plane, which is orthogonal to B0. And then what happens is the magnetization tends to process 
around the external field V0. And then we acquire our signal of interest. And so for people who aren't so familiar with uh, precession of a magnetization, uh, gyroscopes exhibit the same sort of behavior. And many of us have seen gyroscopes in our uh, classical mechanics courses or just at the toy store. Uh, and so I wanted to remind you of just how this procession looks like. So first what's going to happen here is the person has a string wrapped around uh, this hub here. And when they pull the string, it'll get this wheel spinning around its axis. And then they're gonna put it down on a pivot point right here, put it on the pivot point, and we'll see the procession begin. And so this is completely non-intuitive behavior, I would say, um, that, you know, if this wheel was not spinning, the gyroscope would just fall right over. But instead, what it's doing is gravity is acting on it, and it tends to be rotating around the direction that gravity is acting on. So if we try to break this down a little further, we can say that the gyroscope has an angular ve velocity, call that omega. Sorry, I used a different symbol here and here call it a big omega, <laughs> uh, and it has associated with it an angular momentum, a spin angular momentum called L going through its axis. Additionally, there's the force of gravity acting on this wheel, and it's at, acting at a distance R from this pivot point, which means that the wheel is gonna be acted on by a torque. Um, and as a result of this torque, when we have a torque applied, the spin angular momentum will change just due to Newton's laws of motion. And so what we see is that the angular momentum tends to chase the torque, which results in precession at a rate of omega, lowercase omega, given by the ratio of the torque and the angular momentum. And so for a really nice uh, description of this kind of classical mechanical property, I'd highly recommend MIT physics professor Walter Lewin's lecture on this topic and for all the topics he teaches. He's a great educator. <clears throat> and so we have a complete analog of this in MRI, uh, where we have now a, a magnetic dipole in a magnetic field. The dipole has spin angular momentum, L, which is given by the magnetization divided by the gyromagnetic gyro ratio. We saw this earlier. And due to it being in a, an external magnetic field, it is actually acted on by a torque. So when you have a magnetic... Um, when you have magnetization in an external magnetic field, there's a torque on that magnetization. And so that torque will be perpendicular to the angular momentum, and the angular momentum will chase the torque. So this results in precession around our B0 field. And that precession frequency is directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. And then again, the gyromagnetic ratio comes up. On a related note, and this will come up a bit later, we refer to this equation of motion, which is derived from these earlier steps, as the Bloch equation without relaxation. And Bloch was one of the founding kind of contributors to the NMR, to understanding NMR. So please remember this equation. It's written a little differently here, but the, it, this is called the Larmor equation. The frequency of precession is related to the gyromagnetic ratio and the strength of the magnetic field that is applied. This is the one equation that you would maybe want to remember in, MR, in MRI. And so if we look at what are these Larmor frequencies at a couple of our clinical uh, field strengths, it's 64 megahertz at 1.5 T, uh, 123 megahertz at 3 T, and nearly 300 megahertz at 7 T. And so then how exactly though did we get our magnetization down into the transverse plane into the first place, because we know that the dipoles are all aligning along B0. So how did we get them away from B0 in order to commence this precession process? And so the Bloch equation and the Larmor equation actually give us a hint at how we do this by knowing that M will precess about an external field. So if we apply a second magnetic field along an axis that's perpendicular to our main magnetic field, then we can start to view that the, the magnetization will start to process around this second magnetic field. But it can't be a static magnetic field, otherwise then we're just gonna get alignment along the vector sum of B0 and B1. 
So what we need is an extra little ingredient. And that is that the magnitude of B1 should oscillate, actually, or B1 should oscillate at our original Larmor frequency. So we could say that B1 oscillates like a sinusoid at the Larmor frequency, where its maximum and minimum amplitudes are bounded by some value B1. And this is the resonance phenomenon in MRI or NMR. And so the field that we apply is called a radio frequency field because these omegas, omega naught, the Larmor frequency, is in the radio frequency range. And so if we do this and we, we apply this oscillating B1 field, we'll get precession, in this case, in the uh, ZY plane. And if we just keep the B1 field on, we'll just continually get precession. And the precession rate in this case is now omega one, given by the magnitude of the B1 field that we apply and the gyromagnetic ratio. But typically we don't just wanna have our field process in that YZ plane, we wanna do something with it. And so we actually generally want to tip just a certain amount into the transverse plane. And so we can do this by playing our B1 field for a duration, a shorter duration. And then we can calculate our flip angle just by taking the integral that, of the time that that B1 field is on. And so just to give some numbers here of then what our B1 field like is like, if we apply this B1 field for one millisecond and we wanted a 90 degree flip angle, then we'd only need a maximum amplitude of 12 microtesla for this B1 field. So again, the B1 field doesn't need to be large by if we take advantage of this resonance phenomenon. It's, it's nearly one one hundred thousandth of the B0 field that we have to apply. So by applying just a very small B1 field, we can get excitation into our transverse plane. And then so how do we actually use this magnetization once it's in the transverse plane? And we use a, the same phenomenon that's actually used in power generation. So when we develop power, or when we generate power at a power plant, uh, we have a solid uh, permanent magnet that is on a rotor. And when something like some steam passes through this rotor, uh, it will start to rotate the, salt, the permanent magnet, and it's surrounded by conducting coils. And, when the, and they will sense this changing magnetic field in the surrounding coils. We have a similar process in MRI. So when we put our brain into a head coil here, we have all of these conducting coils that are surrounding tiny spinning, mag spinning magnets. In this case, they're detecting the magnetism from the proton of the water molecules. And so just to step through this in a little more detail then of what the signal is that we'll measure. So if we have a coil outside of our object and we have some magnetization um, that is perpendicular to B0, in this case, B0 is coming out of the screen. If, uh, uh, since we know that the magnetization is perpendicular to B0, it's going to process. And what this means is that the magnetic field seen by this electric coil will be changing as the magnetization processes. And we know from Faraday's law that if we have a changing magnetic flux through a conducting loop, that will generate a voltage across that loop. And so we can see that if we were to measure the voltage across that loop, um, it would be oscillating with the precession of that magnetization. So also importantly is that the, the voltage that we're measuring is an integral of the magnetization that uh, it, within our object. And it's proportional to the total magnetization in the object as well as to the Larmor frequency. Um, so our B0 field. So we know that the Larmor frequency is proportional to B0, and we know that the total magnetization we generate is also proportional to B0. So this means that the voltage, the signal that we're going to measure is also is proportional then to the square of our external field. So this is more motivation for us to be moving to higher fields. And so I guess you're sensing a trend here that, you know, I work in the high field lab, and um, so this is some of the motivations for going to higher fields although it does have its own technical challenges. So um, we, we've seen on the previous slide what these sort of array coils look like. So this is um, kind of under the hood. Whenever you put somebody into the MRI, you don't normally see all of this electronics. We have all of these coil loops surrounding um, the head coil 
we put the object in and then we're going to sample the magnetization from each of these channels to try to generate uh, an image of the object. And so if we actually look then at what that signal looks like, we see that uh, due to the precession of the magnetization in the transverse plane, we'll get some oscillating behavior and that will be at our alarm or frequency. We call this the free induction decay. Because in addition to the oscillating behavior, our signal is actually decaying away. And it decays away with a t with, as an exponential decay with a time constant T2. And so we can understand this if we kind of zoom in again at what's going on at the microscopic level. So if these are two protons, each of which are processing around V0, and they have some magnetization, they're not just static other than the precession. They're also undergoing microscopic motion, which includes translations and vibrations and rotations and bumping into each other. And each of them is itself a little magnet as well. So they, generate, so they have their own magnetic field surrounding each of them. So every time they pass close to another one or further away from another one, they're changing the local magnetic field sensed by the neighboring uh, protons. And so we get fluctuations in the Larmor frequency for each individual uh, spin within our system, which results in an irreversible dephasing of the magnetic moment that we get. And that's why we see this decay. It's a random process that decays exponentially. So uh, this sort of relaxation is often referred to as spin-spin relaxation uh, because it's the loss of uh, phase coherence due to one spin acting on another. It's also referred to as transverse relaxation since it's what we measure in the transverse plane, orthogonal to B0, or T2 decay or T2 relaxation or any combination essentially of those words. <laughs> and T2 is actually a very sensitive measure of tissue type as well as pathology. Um, so if we look at three different transverse magnetization decay curves, this is our signal here. Um, plotted on the y-axis over several hundred milliseconds on the, on the x-axis, uh, ignoring now the oscillating component of the signal and just looking at that envelope, uh, we get three very different types of relaxation curves for three different tissues and brains. So we have CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. It has a very long T2. It's not even very, it's not easy to measure at all since it's so long. We have gray matter, which has a sort of intermediate length T2 of about 110 milliseconds. And we have white matter, which is a T2 of maybe 80 milliseconds, all at 3T. These can change, these will change at different field strengths. And so if we choose to acquire our image at a, a given echo time, we can try to maximize the contrast that we'll see between these different tissue types. So we acquire the image at a given time, which we call the echo time. This is an important term as well when you're at the MRI console, often denoted by TE, the abbreviation time to echo. And so here we can generate now a T2 weighted image. And we'll see that CSF is bright because it had lots of signal remaining, not, not much transverse decay. Gray matter is an intermediate sort of gray. And then white matter is the darkest gray. Uh, just because they each have different T2 relaxation times. <clears throat> uh, in addition to our T2 decay, um, that is the case, the T2 decay is the result of microscopic field inhomogeneities. And in reality, we actually have macroscopic field in inhomogeneities. We don't have a perfect um, B0 field throughout our object. This is because we have imperfections in the magnet itself, but those are actually a very small quantity. What's more important is that the tissue uh, within the body it has, a, has its own magnetic, magnetic susceptibility and it tends to magnetize when it's, um, when it's exposed to an external magnetic field. And that magnetization itself distorts the magnetic field. So this means that this proton over here might see a slightly larger uh, or higher uh, magnetic field than this one over here, will process at different rates and we'll get faster signal decay. And so that's what's shown here. And we characterize this decay by also an exponential decay term, but with, uh, with the decay term called T2 star, the apparent transverse relaxation time, as opposed to T2. And T2 star will always be less than T2. Uh, 
<clears throat> T2 star is an important source of uh, contrast for the blood oxygenation level dependent signal or bold signal, which is uh, kind of the primary working horse for fMRI studies. Uh, but importantly, we can also recover this T2 loss with what's called a spin echo sequence. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go into it right now. Uh, but this is also a kind of seminal pulse sequence used in MRI. Okay, so in addition to the transverse signal de uh, decay, uh, after we've excited our magnetization, it tends to recover back to its equilibrium state uh, with a time constant called T1. So this is the realignment of the dipole moments with B0. It's a random return of energy that was imparted into the spin system by our excitation, and it's returning that energy back to the surrounding tissue. So if we look at what happens when we apply our excitation pulse, so a 90 degree excitation pulse with our B1 field, initially we're at equilibrium. When we apply the 90 degree, degree pulse, so now, sorry, we're just looking at the Z component of the magnetization. So initially it was aligned completely with B0 along the Z direction. We apply the 90 degree pulse, it's now down to zero. We have no uh, longitudinal mag magnetization present. But it will then slowly recover back to its equilibrium position. And it will recover again with an exponential decay term uh, with a time constant T1, like I'd said. And so we call this spin lattice relaxation because the spins themselves are returning the energy from the RF excitation back to the tissue, to the lattice system. Also known as longitudinal relaxation because it's recovering uh, uh, along the longitudinal axis, the Z axis, uh, or T1 recovery, or again, combinations of those, those terms. But this MZ is really important in MRI because it dictates what's the maximum signal level we can achieve when we then actually do excitation and, and measure our signal. And so this next slide uh, hopes to demonstrate that fact. So in a typical MRI experiment, we apply our excitation pulses uh, periodically in time. Uh, and they're separated in time by, uh, by a period of time called the repetition time, or TR. And so we'll apply these uh, pulses periodically. And now we just want to see what's going on with the longitudinal magnetization as well as with our signal or the transverse magnetization. So everything that's in the XY plane. So initially we have, we're at equilibrium. So we have just longitudinal magnetization. We have no transverse magnetization. It's down at zero. We apply our first 90 degree pulse. So we lose all of our longitudinal magnetization and it goes all into the transverse plane. Very quickly though, we get T2 or T2 star decay of MXY, and we also get a slow recovery of MZ. Uh, but we don't, we don't get full recovery of MZ before the time of our next excitation pulse. And so what happens is we tip down, we apply another 90, so we lose all of our MZ, and it goes all into MXY. But it's no longer at M0, you can see, it's at a slightly lower level now. And so we repeat this process. And this is what every MRI experiment consists of. It's just uh, can, almost every MRI experiment it consists of repetitive application of RF pulses and then measuring signal at a given time. Um, it's not always going to be a 90 degree excitation pulse and there's a lot of variations on it, but this is kind of like your first flavor of a pulse sequence in MRI. And this is just to highlight again that, um, I'll just hit this once more, that we have a reduction in MZ based on how closely spaced these excitation pulses are, and as well as what is our flip angle. And so we need to always consider, oh, we also need to then consider what is it going to be our repetition time in an experiment? What flip angle are we going to use? And that will all kind of be hinging on what is the relaxation time, the T1 relaxation time that we're interested in. If this T1 was much shorter, we might have gotten back to complete recovery by the time of our next 90 degree pulse. <clears throat> Another really important pulse sequence in MRI is inversion recovery. And this is really important because it can maximize our T1 contrast. So here we're just looking at the Z component of our magnetization again to see how we can generate a range of tissue contrasts, again in uh, white matter, gray matter, and CSF. 
So in this case, instead of applying a 90 degree pulse, we apply a 180 degree pulse. So this will fully invert our magnetization. Rather than tip it into the transverse plane, it will fully invert it. And then some of the, uh, you know, one tissue will recover with a certain amount of uh, T1 recovery. Another tissue will have less T1 recovery. And then finally, this last tissue will have even less recovery in that time period that we're imaging. And so these actually correspond then to these three tissues of CSF, gray matter, and white matter. CSF has a very slow recovery of uh, along the Z axis, and white matters is the fastest. So just like uh, before, we can choose then to generate an image to try to maximize our contrast in the uh, throughout the image, depending on the tissue T1s. And so we'll generate that image by applying an excitation pulse and quickly uh, measuring out uh, with as little T2 or T2 star decay as possible. And so this will generate what we call a T1 weighted image. So here we can see CSF now is dark because we chose our um, time to image when there was essentially no uh, MZ left. And MZ is you know, critically important. It kind of tells us what, how much gas is in the tank. And so if we're gonna image when there's no gas in the tank, we're gonna get no signal. Um, whereas gray matter, oops, Gray matter is sort of this intermediate uh, gray color <laughs> that we see here. And white matter then has the brightest signal. Um, so this is kind of opposite of what we normally see in a T2 experiment, a T2 weighted image. Okay, so I decided to make a quiz and uh, I didn't have time to make a poll, but people can use, I don't know if the, um, if we have, uh, we can allow people to talk if they raise their hand if you want. Oh, no, people can maybe, is there a chat? Do we have the chat feature yes, or Q&A? Yes. Or Q &A? Yeah, maybe there are both sections. People get, get into the chat forum or the Q&A. Uh, let's use one of them. Do we, what do we have, Val? <laughs> uh, let's use the chat. Yeah. Uh, you should just remember to send a message to all oh, instead of yeah. just, yeah, panelists or just participants. Yeah. Okay. okay, so first quiz question. MRI is prime, and this is a fill in the blank. Prim MRI is primarily sensitive to signal coming from what? Is it A, hydrogen nuclei, B, the nucleus accumbens, C, positron annihilation, or D, ectoplasm? So why don't we give people five, ten seconds. Do we have something going on in the chat? Looks like the chat is going. Sweet. Okay, I think that's enough answers. Everybody is saying A, and that is correct. MRI is primarily sensitive to signal from hydrogen nuclei. The nucleus accumbens is somewhere in the brain, as far as uh, so I'm told. Positron annihilation is critically important in PET imaging. And ectoplasm is really important uh, when trying to communicate with species of the other domains or dimensions, like ghosts and phantoms. <laughs> Okay, another quiz question. I didn't have time to go into this so much, unfortunately, but maybe some of you picked up on it. So T2 star decay can be partially recovered by a blank acquisition. A, magnetization recovery. B, total protonic reversal. C, spin echo. Or D, positron annihilation. Oh, you guys are so good. All right, so everybody that answered at least is saying C, and spin echo is correct. And I'm sorry we didn't go into it in detail, but you guys are experts from the looks of things anyway. Okay, so that was kind of it for, for the discussion on the uh, contrast mechanisms of how do we actually get different brightnesses throughout an image. Now I'm gonna briefly go over uh, exactly how we form an image. And so specifically, how do we get different measurements from different spatial locations? And so um, when we think of imaging, uh, say from a digital camera, we tend to have a grid of sensors. And so an image is focused onto that grid of sensors and each sensor carries with it some sort of spatial information itself. 
And so if we read out um, from this grid and then project that onto a display, we're going to get a one-to-one -one kind of relation here from sensor element to pixels in the image. So this is how a typical digital camera works. Um, but MRI is not like that at all, actually. We have one detector, whereas here there's millions of detectors in a digital camera. In MRI, we, we, we have one detector, or as we saw before, maybe 32 detectors, but not nearly enough to generate the millions of voxels that we look at in a 3D image, such as here on the right. And so first, let's just review again, sort of the excitation and signal receiving process. So as you recall, we put an object into a very large magnetic field. The spin magnetic, uh, the magnetic dipoles will tend to kind of align with that main magnetic field. If we apply a B1 field or an RF excitation pulse, this will get the magnetic dipoles to process around V0 at the Larmor frequency given by the product of the gyromagnetic ratio and the B0 magnitude. And then shortly after, we'll, we'll actually measure the signal coming off of these um, using, again, Faraday's law of induction. So how do we differentiate the signal coming from these different locations? And the answer is we'll spatially encode them with different magnetic fields. And so we apply a gradient magnetic field. For instance, we apply one along the x direction so that protons that here on the left side are spinning at a slightly faster rate or processing at a slightly faster rate than those on the right. And so based on these differences in precession frequency, we can start to get a sense for where in the object or the body um, our signal is coming from. If we can tease apart our, our signal on a frequency basis. And so we can apply those gradients along X, Y, as well as Z in any sort of arbitrary orientation. And so if we look at just the signal coming from just a 1D object, for instance, we have our magnetization in the transverse plane, and it is processing at some frequency f, which is given by the Larmor equation. Again, so it has the uh, precession around B0 frequency here, but it also has an additional term given by where the object is in space. So we apply a gradient along x, that's changing the magnetic field along Z. This is also a point of confusion. The magnetic field is not along X. It's actually still changing the field along Z, but it depends on where you are in space in X position. And so if we write this out again, looking at this integral, there's no X dependence in our signal uh, in, this, um, in this exponential term here, which is just our carrier frequency. B0 uh, due to the B0 field itself. Um, we have now just an integral that depends on the magnitude of the gradient we've applied, the position of our spins in space, and how long this gradient's been applied for. If we do a change of variables, so we change this gamma gxt into a variable called k sub x, then the equation is, is unchanged, but uh, looks like in this format here. And so now our signal appears actually to be a function of this k variable rather than time. And so in fact, this is actually the Fourier, Fourier transform of our magnetization m with respect to the frequency spatial frequency variable k. And so this has really important ramifications for imaging and that by applying these gradients G, we can steer through K space, is what we call it. And K space is just the spatial frequency content of our object. And so we'll try to step through that again in a somewhat pictorial way. So again, we have all of our spins processing uh, in our object in the external magnetic field. And we're gonna turn on these x and y gradients in an alternating fashion so that we can step through all of our case space uh, to measure all the spatial frequency content of our object. So first we turn on x and we sample this line of case space. We apply a small blip in y 
So we've moved up now in k-space, and we'll sample another line uh, by turning on the x coil again. And we'll repeat this. We'll repeat this over and over until we've acquired all of the data that we want throughout our k-space. So this looks nothing like a brain. Um, I'd also want to add that that trajectory that we did was an EPI trajectory, which is uh, very common and popular for fMRI, diffusion, perfusion imaging. But anyways, this looks nothing like a brain itself, but we know that we have this relation for, with the Fourier transform and our case space. So what we do is we can take an inverse Fourier transform in two dimensions here and generate an image of a slice of brain. And so this is the basic principle then of spatial encoding in MRI. And so uh, in our next lecture, which will be in two weeks from now, uh, Eugene Milstein is going to go over more principles of image encoding in the MRI artifacts uh, lesson. So stay tuned there for a little bit more details on how we do image encoding. But I also want to add, though, that this case-based perspective uh, of doing our imaging offers a lot of flexibility in our acquisition. So in the previous slide, I showed the zigzagging uh, sort of uh, trajectory that we acquired data in in K-space. Uh, but what's more conventional for anatomical imaging, at least, is to do what's called a spin warp acquisition, where we acquire one line of K-space at a time. And each line is separated uh, in time in the acquisition by that TR parameter that we went over earlier. And so that's why we also, why that's such a critically important parameter when we're doing our imaging, is to ensure that we have enough signal or just the right enough amount of signal uh, when, we, when we acquire our data. Because we're gonna repeat this excitation pulse over and over and over to acquire each line of case space. We can also acquire data radially. So, or in a spiral, and I'm sorry I couldn't, I'm not proficient enough in PowerPoint to get that spiral in a short amount of time. But this is just to say that uh, there's several ways that we can acquire our data. Um, and if you, if you want to come up with creative ways that you think are efficient uh, ways of sampling data of interest, um, then this is a huge domain of research uh, as well you know, at the Martino Center and, and as well as throughout the uh, MRI community. And so that is kind of the, the gist of the talk in terms of spatial encoding. Um, I just wanted to return to this opening figure uh, to kind of go over again some of the properties that I had discussed, others I haven't discussed, but will come up in future why and how lectures, uh, now that we have a better sense for what is generating the contrast MRI. So here on the top left, we have an MP-Rage image, and so it's really sensitive to T1, like we discussed before. So the T1 of CSF is long, and so we get very little signal from it in, the event in CSF. Um, we also, in this case, this is on our 7T scanner, we get a lot of bright vessels um, due to an effect called inflow effect, because we have only the head being excited and spins that are flowing in from out of the head um, appear brighter. This, could, this is actually considered an artifact um, in, when you're trying to do anatomical imaging, these bright vessels. Um, because we're just trying to parcelate what is gray matter, what is white matter, say in FreeSurfer, um, so that's an artifact in that case. Uh, so it, it will have a negative impact on trying to distinguish what is white matter, gray matter. But often we actually are very interested in this sort of contrast if we want to visualize the vessels themselves. Next, we have a turbo spin echo acquisition. And so it's really sensitive to T2, like we had discussed, as well as property called magnetization transfer, where uh, macromolecules, which are very immobile, will also tend to steal signal from our water molecules. And so that's especially present in white matter where there's lots of macromolecules uh, in the myelin uh, surrounding axons. So we'll get darker signal, enhanced kind of darker signal in a sense uh, due to this MT effect. On the right, we have diffusion tractography imaging. So this is um, showing kind of principal orientations of fibers throughout the brain. And this is uh, based on a contrast that we can generate uh, based on the diffusion of the water molecules and how they have preferred diffusion directions throughout these tracks. On the bottom is a bold fMRI um, kind of activation map overlaid on a 
T2 star awaited image. Um, so I'd mentioned this before. So uh, that, that T2 star is critically important for bold imaging. And the way this works is that there's deoxyhemoglobin uh, that contains iron throughout the blood vessels and the amount of uh, during activation, say during a finger tapping task, like in this task here, this is the hand uh, motor region. During a finger tapping task, blood flow will increase to that area to supply more nutrients and the amount of deoxyhemoglobin goes down, you have less iron and your T2 star gets longer and you have an increase in signal that's correlated with the neural activity. Uh, this is a more exotic technique that I'm, uh, I don't have personal experience with, but called double inversion recovery. So you can actually null, so, so like in an MP rage, we wanted to null just the CSF signal because we were more interested in gray matter and white matter. Here we can null multiple uh, tissues of interest if we want. And so this is also a T1 weighted image. And then susceptibility weighted imaging is also really common. Um, and just like in fMRI, we're mostly interested in deoxyhemoglobin in blood vessels. And so it's uh, really sensitive to the deoxyhemoglobin and we perform some image processing techniques to even enhance that further. Um, and this is really important in say, um, uh, areas where you might have some sort of uh, vascular disorder, like in a stroke imaging, or um, also in multiple sclerosis, there's often some sort of central vein effects. And so at 7T, this gets even stronger and you can see those uh, properties better. And so thank you so much for your time. Thanks for the invitation to present here. Um, I also am really grateful to Patrick McDaniel and Kevin Setzenpop to sharing their slides. Um, and for continued support at the center. I know this is a challenging time. Um, and so thanks so much for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions in the remaining time.